Thank you. So um, our third paper today is by Mat Matthias Stepke and Veronica Selez Selezneva, how'd I do? Good. Uh, of Northwestern and Martin Schneider of Stanford. Uh, they, they build an economic model that helps us think about, and using actually some of the survey of consumer finance data, uh, John, that helps us think about, okay, if wealth changes, it changes differently for different sets of people in the economy. And when we think about the distributional impact of quantitative easing, when we try and answer the question, does it increase or decrease inequality, you have to look at the different categories of people and how much their wealth changes because it's really a question of summing up the winners and comparing them to the losers. So as you'll hear, they find, they use a, a, a model of where they tr say if the Fed sets out to increase inflation, which is kind of a proxy for QE, what happens to different groups of people, different groups of homeowners. Um, so Matthias is going to give the uh, initial presentation and then we're very pleased to have Jean Bovin, who's the former Deputy Finance Minister from Canada, who's actually done a lot of thinking about these uh, questions now at BlackRock uh, to, uh, to respond. Thank you. Right, thanks for the introduction. It's good to be here. So this paper touches on many of the same, uh, same themes we've already talked about the, in the first two presentations. The difference is that we talk, um, we approach this more from the perspective of formal macroeconomic uh, modeling. So, uh, so as, we, as we have already discussed, uh, monetary policy works in part by moving interest rates, both uh, the short-term real rate by setting the federal funds rate, uh, to some extent uh, long rates if you think of uh, quantitative easing having some, some impact on the uh, slope of the yield curve, and uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, normal rates also through inflation and future inflation expectations. If people expect high inflation, normal rates will go up to compensate for this high inflation. So in this paper, we want to document um, uh, exactly how large this distribution would be for alternative policy scenarios and then use a formal macroeconomic model to uh, figure out the consequences of those changes for macro aggregates and also for, for welfare. So compared to the previous papers, it's kind of the same question, more applied to uh, a formal, uh, from a, more applied from a formal modeling perspective. So the motivation for this paper, in fact, goes back uh, some time. So now this is a concern that is uh, very widespread with recent uh, changes in the macroeconomic environment. But Martin and I both grew up in Germany, and as you may know, uh, Germans have a pathological uh, fear of inflation. You know? And so, so what was kind of uh, uh, interesting for us is that when you grow up in Germany, in elementary school, you learn that inflation is bad. They t tell you this in, in, in second grade, and they tell you it's bad because of redistribution. So the reason you're told about is that uh, if inflation is high, grandma will lose her money because it's in the same account that has a fixed interest rate. And so this is really about a redistribution effect. And then later you go to graduate school and then you have a bunch of monetary models. All monetary models you uh, see in graduate schools are models with only one household. There's only one person in there. There is no different household. There is no redistribution. And so this, this kind of dissonance between what we learned about why inflation is bad and what the models actually do, this is what the initial motivation was. And so what we're trying to do here is to use a model that has different types of people where redistribution can happen and then use this model to figure out whether what we learned back in elementary school actually makes, uh, makes any sense. So that's, uh, that's uh, the, uh, the overall plan, which of course has now become uh, you know, of more uh, current importance. So uh, the first step of, uh, of this uh, research program is to uh, document uh, in the data exactly who holds uh, nominal assets and who has nominal debt. You know, if, you, uh, if you are a lender, you're going to lose uh, from, from high inflation. It's going to devalue the value of what you have. If you're a borrower, if you have a big mortgage, it's actually great for you to have inflation because the uh, real value of the mortgage uh, shrinks, the house uh, appreciates with inflation, and you are, you're going to have a wealth gain. And so the first thing you have to do is document who has what in the economy. And so for this, we use the flow of funds accounts and also the survey of consumer finances. We use the 2013 edition of this, so it's kind of a very current uh, picture of what the distribution of nominal wealth looks like in the U.S. economy. A key part of that work is to distinguish uh, assets liabilities by maturity, because uh, if you think about changes in inflation expectations, such as a new announcement of a higher inflation target, uh, this will affect uh, short and long duration assets very differently. If you have uh, money in a uh, in an account with a daily changing interest rate, you're not really that much exposed to change in future expectations because interest rates will adjust to this. On the other hand, if you have a 30-year mortgage or a 10-year government bond, those will be, uh, the prices of those, the values of those will be highly reactive. And so, so in this data, we uh, uh, document uh, not just uh, who holds what, but also what the average duration is of essence of liabilities for different groups in the, uh, in the economy. So I don't want to talk about the uh, data in, uh, in, in too much detail. I'll just show you one picture for the uh, economic aggregates. 
So this, sho this picture shows you as a fraction of GDP the overall asset position of the uh, US household sector. So we simply look here at the flow of funds and sum up all the nominal uh, assets and all the nominal liabilities. And nominal here means in terms of US dollars because that's what, uh, what's, uh, I guess what's uh, affected by changes in inflation. Uh, so, the, uh, so the green line is uh, the uh, assets and then the uh, solid blue line is the directly held debt. So this is things like mortgages. What we also account for is that you have some indirect holdings. What do we mean by this? So the, uh, the household sector owns firms uh, through uh, stocks and also through mutual funds, and the, uh, the uh, corporate sector itself has debt also. So there, there's uh, debt on the corporate side. And so if, the, uh, if debt gets devalued through inflation, you would expect that the real value of, uh, of um, of, of holding the uh, corporate sector uh, goes up also. And, and so, so the, uh, the uh, total debt, the, uh, the uh, dashed uh, blue line, uh, essentially consolidates the uh, firm sector into the household sector to, uh, to take account of this fact. So uh, two things you can see here is that there was a huge increase in, uh, in the uh, liabilities, in the debt of the household sector after about 1980. Uh, and, uh, and you can see, in fact, that uh, just before the crisis, the uh, dashed blue line and the green line uh, coincide. Uh, so for, for a short moment of time, we had uh, the, uh, the U.S. household sector essentially being balanced in terms of assets and liabilities. And that's very unusual because uh, traditionally the uh, household sector was a net lender and the government was a net borrower. You know, so uh, so the, uh, the government debt was financed by the U.S. household sector, and that changed massively from 1980 until uh, 2006 or 2007 or so. This reflects the huge inflow of... Um, of funds uh, from abroad. You know, so, uh, so foreigners weren't really holding many uh, US assets uh, previously, but uh, that changed after 1980. And uh, by about 2006, um, essentially all, uh, all US government debt uh, on average was held abroad. Of course not uh, you know, every single bond because there's huge differences and, uh, in, in, in holdings, but the overall uh, nominal investments of the, uh, of the foreign sector in the U.S. economy was essentially equal to government debt, and therefore the household sector is, is roughly balanced. So that, that's kind of uh, one thing that has changed massively and also is, is kind of relevant for potential redistribution implications of, uh, of inflation. Let me see, after the crisis, uh, huge leveraging, so, so both lines uh, uh, drop very quickly, and uh, so, so now there's a, a new gap opening up between uh, assets and liabilities. Okay, but this is the aggregate, uh, the aggregate picture. What we're more interested in is uh, redistribution within the household sector. So we see that the household sector as a whole has huge assets and huge liabilities. Of course, if you look at individual households, there are different households who have the assets and different households who have the liabilities. You have to distinguish those to see who gains and who loses uh, from inflation or other changes in interest rates. And so that's what the rest of the paper does. So you can do, uh, with this uh, accounting framework, with the modeling framework, you can do many different experiments. The one I want to show you uh, uh, today for the most part, is uh, essentially an experiment of raising future inflation. So, so, uh, so this is a bit related to QE, but it's more related to uh, changing the inflation target, which is another policy option people have been discussing recently, partly because of concerns about the zero lower bound. You know, so we have uh, now uh, a period of uh, zero interest rates, not just here, but also in, in Japan for many years now, which has raised to, uh, to questions about that it wouldn't be safer to have a somewhat higher inflation target. And so here we, we figure out what would happen if the Fed were uh, to announce uh, a new inflation target as five percentage points higher than, uh, than the previous target. You know, of course, you can scale this up and down any way, uh, any way you want. And so the experiment is that this announcement is made. And we're going, what I'm going to show you is uh, the outcome if uh, after this announcement, uh, the rest of the uh, change in inflation is fully anticipated. So people believe what's going to happen, and then everything's under perfect foresight. If there's, uh, if there's uh, a repeated surprise, so people don't quite believe, or if there's changes in the future also, everything is the same, only bigger. You know, so repeated surprises lead to larger redistribution effects. In our experiment, because everything's anticipated, uh, this change will lead to a parallel uptrift in the yield curve. So at all horizons, the uh, interest rates will, the nominal rates will uh, jump by, by 5%, essentially to compensate for this uh, higher inflation. Okay, so uh, here is uh, just from the data and the uh, uh, assumed experiment, the uh, impact on the wealth of different types of households of this, uh, of this redistribution. We, uh, we do it in the paper for many different groups, but the uh, most important ones to consider are these three. So the first group is renters, and on the uh, x-axis you see the age. So these are households of different ages who uh, happen to rent their home. The, uh, at the bottom you see the rich, and the rich we define as the top 10% by net worth uh, in each age cohort. And we distinguish the rich because uh, you know, it is well known that uh, the wealth distribution is highly concentrated. So uh, there's a small percentage uh, group at the, at the top that accounts for most wealth holdings. So we look at those separately. And then what's left is uh, essentially everybody else. These are people who are not rich uh, and own their homes. So we call these middle class, uh, middle class homeowners. 
what you see in the picture is the change in wealth uh, from this, uh, the, the immediate change in wealth from this new inflation path for each group expressed as a percent of, of GDP. Okay, so the first thing you can see from this picture is that renters are not affected, not surprisingly. They are, they're renting a house, they don't have a mortgage, they're also not rich, they don't have many assets, so, so they are, the impact on their position will be very small. There's some, but it's small. Uh, the uh, losses are essentially coming all from one group, which is the old rich. You know, so if you look at the negative numbers there, it is uh, rich people over about 55 years of age uh, who, are taking, who are taking this hit. And this is a percent of GDP, but it is uh, for a group that's only two and a half uh, uh, years uh, in, in width. So, so each group makes up only about uh, one or two percent of the population. So, so a one percent, one percent change in wealth compared to GDP, uh, if you're only one percent of the of population, is actually a very large wealth change. So these uh, these older among the rich are losing a lot, and this is because the old rich uh, have a large portfolio of bonds and uh, and savings. We talk a lot about the uh, rich being. Uh, uh, highly invested in, in, uh, in equity, and it's true that the, the ratio of equity to fixed income investments is higher for the rich compared to the middle class, but because the rich are so rich, it's still true that they still account also for most of the holdings of uh, nominal assets. And that's why this is uh, where, the where the losses are. Those are the gains. The gains uh, come from uh, essentially from holding mortgages. You know, so, so the gains occur if you have debt, and the main source of debt is, uh, is mortgages, and the people who have mortgages are the uh, middle class, uh, and uh, a middle age. You know, if, you're, if you're rich, you're rich enough not to have a mortgage, so the uh, top 10% rarely have any debt at all. Uh, if you're very old, you probably have paid back your mortgage. If you're very young, you haven't uh, bought a house yet. It's, uh, it's the middle income, uh, middle age range. And so you see from about age uh, 30 to about uh, 50, uh, large gains close to 1% uh, of GDP for these groups. And again, these are groups that are about 2% uh, uh, of, uh, of households. So for them, it, it, compared to the income, it's, it's, it's a huge change in, uh, in wealth, just because the, the mortgage typically is, uh, is, is very large compared to household income. Many people have mortgages that are multiple of their annual household income. So we see in the aggregate, essentially, a large flow from the old rich to the um, middle class, uh, middle aged. Okay, and uh, and so that's kind of interesting on its own. But the next step is to figure out what does this uh, flow of wealth does to the macroeconomy. For that, you kind of need to need a, you need a model. You need to understand uh, how does the behavior of the rich old differ from the behavior of these middle class households uh, to see whether these effects uh, are going to cancel out in the aggregate or if there's something that that is going to happen to the uh, macroeconomy. So this is where the model comes in. We built a kind of fairly rich life cycle model uh, with different types of households, the different wealth, income. There's income shocks, so income is uh, variable over time. Also preferences. We have preferences in there because we want to capture the fact that uh, a fraction of households is financially constrained. And certainly uh, whether you're financially constrained, meaning you're close to a borrowing constraint or not, will have some bearing on how your consumption is going to react to changes in your wealth. And then we also have, of course, differences in the asset position. Uh, a key part of the paper, which uh, rhymes with uh, many of the, with the two other papers in this, in this session, is that we uh, really focus on the housing sector. You know, so we saw that mortgages are kind of a very important part of the transmission of these shocks. So understanding how house prices react is, is going to be important. And so we have uh, different types of houses in there. There's a renting and buying decision. And uh, we also distinguish uh, two, two segments in the housing market, small and large houses. And I, I will show you in a second how this is relevant. The way the model works is the smaller open economy as far as the real interest rate is concerned. So, so think of this as being set in world markets, but the uh, housing market uh, clears inside the country. You know, so there's going to be repercussions for, for housing prices. And then, uh, so what we do then formally is we calibrate the model to US data. Uh, we uh, introduce this uh, policy change as a shock uh, in the, uh, to an economy that's in the steady state. Uh, and we're essentially going to change the, um, the wealth position of each household based on what I've shown you from the data. So we're going to take the middle class, middle age uh, in our model and make them uh, richer or, or kind of lower the debt in line with what's in the data. We're going to take the old uh, rich in our model and make them poorer uh, compared to what's uh, at the same amount what's in the data. And then we just compute forward what's going to happen to this uh, economy. So let me show you kind of the main points from, uh, from the results. So the first here is on housing prices. So on the axis is years, uh, from zero to 25 years after the shock. On the uh, uh, vertical axis is the percentage change in housing prices. So what you see is uh, prices go up, but they go up uh, only for, for the large houses. They actually don't go up at all for the, uh, for the small houses. And that's was something we were surprised by initially, but it actually makes a lot of sense. So, so, so why is this? So, so the gains uh, from this shock go to these uh, middle class uh, mortgage borrowers. And, uh, and so, so this, uh, this uh, increase in wealth, you would expect, uh, gives you an increase in the demand for houses. You know, they, they are richer now, they want to, want to have more. One thing they would have more of is, is houses. Uh, 
But the key thing about these uh, borrowers is they already have a house, and so the demand that they have is going to be for upgrade houses. You know, they, they at some point want to move to a bigger house, and so, uh, so the exchange of prices for the houses they want to move to, not the house they're in right now. Whereas the demand, the, the marginal demand for the smallest houses comes from people who don't have houses yet. These are starter houses. And the demand for that, those comes from renters, but renters don't gain from inflation. You know, so, so you do have an impact on housing, uh, on housing uh, values, but it's really uh, further up in the distribution. It's not for the, for the lowest level of, of houses. So if you're concerned about, uh, for example, the, the very um, entry levels of the markets where we had kind of the biggest... Uh, uh, biggest change in the crisis, uh, this policy actually wouldn't help you uh, as much as we perhaps initially would have expected. Uh, let me talk a bit about uh, macro aggregates. So, so here's uh, uh, changes in uh, aggregate consumption and change in aggregate output over the uh, uh, 25 years after the shock. So I'm going to say, uh, again, a couple of things about this. Uh, the first thing to notice about these changes is that they are extremely persistent. You know, m most of the time when we talk about monetary policy, we measure impacts in terms of quarters, you know, what happens two, three quarters afterwards. This picture is in terms of years, and you see these effects are around for many years. You know, so, uh, so the impact on output uh, peaks after uh, two and a half years, but it's, it's kind of visible at least uh, 10, 15 years after the shock. And this is because these changes uh, come through uh, change in wealth, and change in wealth are going to be affecting the economy until essentially courts are replaced by new courts. You know, people have to age and die, and young people have to be born for these things to go, to go away. So, uh, so these things aren't uh, super large in impact, but they're extremely persistent. This is something to keep in mind when uh, thinking about distribution effects. The other thing is that the effect is in fact negative. You know, so, so output falls and, and consumption falls. And, uh, and the reason this is happening is that um, uh, first thinking about consumption is that uh, the uh, losses go to, to older people. And in a life cycle model, the older people have a higher propensity to consume because they are working over a smaller horizon. Whereas the young people have many years to, to consider. And so they're going to uh, save a relatively larger fraction of their gain and not spend this much. Again, this is uh, natural from uh, the perspective of a life cycle model. We would have expected initially it may go the other way around because of financial constraints. You know, people are financially constrained. If they are kind of at the borrowing constraint, uh, getting a, a windfall would, uh, would make you spend a, a lot of consumption right now. And, and we did uh, design the model to capture this, so we have people who are impatient who had the borrowing constraint, and still it wasn't enough. So, uh, so it seems that because the gains go to essentially the people with the biggest mortgages, and those aren't the poorest people, that the, uh, the age effect still dominates. Okay, so I will think I will skip this one. Uh, just to talk about welfare, I want to say two things about this. So, so the welfare effects are um, modified to some extent because of the impact on housing prices. You know, so if you, if you have a direct uh, uh, loss uh, to, your, to your wealth, but the house that, that you go up, uh, that, that you own goes up in, in value, that would, uh, that would mitigate to some extent the direct, uh, the direct effect. So you kind of have to look at the model to understand the full impact on welfare. What's even more important, I think, is to look at this picture and just notice the scale. You know, so everything else I've so shown you at the scale where at the upper end was like a 2% change. Here the change uh, that you see is a 10% change. And, and the units here are uh, uh, units of consumption. So, so what uh, essentially 5% change means, which is what our 50-year-old middle-class households gain, is that this change in inflation makes them as much better off uh, uh, as they would be if you increase the inflation permanently by 5%. You know, and uh, if, you, if you have seen any macro models, a welfare change of 5% is just uh, huge. You know, most uh, policy changes that we consider have uh, changes in welfare that are, that are on the order of magnitude of a fraction of a percent, and here you get multiple percents. You know, so, so what I'm, I'm trying to point out here is that the stakes for welfare of particular groups are just, are just huge. You know, so, so the potential impact that you would get from change in inflation if you, uh, if you have a large mortgage uh, completely uh, outweigh any other policy changes, which, which to me suggests that... Um, Thinking about the political economy of this is actually quite important you know, because uh, people have very much reason to be concerned about these changes, much more so than most uh, other macro policy changes. Okay, so we also did an interest rate shock. Uh, it, it interest rates, I'm out of time, so I won't go, uh, I won't go into that. Uh, let me just say that, uh, that lowering real interest rates, in fact, turns out to be quite similar in the implications uh, than our inflation experiment, uh, even though the uh, effects overall are... Um, are larger in magnitude, you know, and uh, and this was touched on before. So, so there there's some uh, some debate on whether changing interest rates is good or bad for you know rich or poor people. In our model, it's certainly uh, good for the uh, middle class mortgage borrowers, just because mortgages get cheaper. It's uh, it's bad for the uh, for the old rich. And there's some there's some debate about ch uh, change in asset prices. It's of course true that if you have a long term bond and interest rates fall, that the value of that bond goes up in the short term. But if you're a saver and if saving is what you do, uh, real interest rates just aren't going to be good for you. And this is kind of what comes out in the model. Okay, so let me uh, summarize kind of the key points. Uh, 
uh, I think the most important point to notice is that the change in welfare from inflation or other, you know, redistributive change that, that is huge. So, so in that sense, the uh, Germans had some some reason, I think, to be concerned about that because that's really what dominates if you think about a personal perspective, what you should think about inflation. But the effect on aggregates are highly persistent because they are, these are driven by wealth and they don't go away as long as the cohorts that are affected are around. The effect on aggregates uh, tend, to be, uh, tend, to, tend, to, tend to be downward, so a downward shift in labor supply and output, a bit different from what we may have expected. And there is an impact on, ho uh, on, uh, on housing prices, but the housing price is more affected up in the distribution as opposed to for the starter level homes. Thanks. So thank you very much uh, for having me here and giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, these issues and to have uh, had the chance to spend some time on this, uh, on this very interesting piece of work. Um, so I have a few comments to make and maybe as a way to start, um, I will just start with some, uh, some initial considerations. So the conference, uh, I took the topic and the question of what we're trying to address today, uh, maybe literally, and I want to preface my comment by, um, by saying that, uh, because I think there's a lot of interesting results from the paper uh, and that have implications beyond the questions we're trying to tackle with today. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to uh, s see what the paper tells us about the question we're trying to do today. And I think questions about um, QE, monetary policy, unconventional policies, and their impact on inequality, I think that raises the question of what do we mean by monetary policy, and I'll, I'll make a couple of comments on this uh, and trying to think uh, about what they have presented here in terms of result and whether this is, um, uh, what aspect of monetary policy this is really talking about. And I think, uh, I think at the end of the day, the essence of my comment are about a distinction, I think, uh, in terms of what we mean by countercyclical policies, uh, monetary policy versus what we think should be design feature of monetary policy itself. And I think this paper speaks more about the framework and the design feature than countercyclical policies um, uh, and whether QE or conventional policies are bad or good for inequality. So that's, that's the setup. I think, I think uh, Matthias did a fantastic job describing the paper and the result. I had prepared a slide in case he had not done that, uh, but uh, I, I, will, I, will, uh, I will just re just now show that I've, I think I've understood the paper. Uh, so it starts from an obs observation that uh, we have large gross nominal positions, uh, which means that inflation could potentially have a very important implication in terms of welfare distributions. Um, and the experiment that is being uh, considered here is uh, what if the Fed were to increase its inflation target from 2% to 7% for 10 years. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm making it as explicit as I can because I'm going to come back to that and try to think about, okay, uh, how do we think about this experiment? Um, then we have an environment uh, in which they're going to be carrying out this, this experiment and the design ingredients uh, are, we have a, a world where uh, there's borrowing constraints, so that's going to explain part of the result. Uh, we also have households that are different, and they're different in terms of the, the, their age, uh, their pa patients, and also um, we assume that there's some inequality at the, at the outset. Uh, so the, these, these, these households are exogenously uh, different uh, in terms of the inequality outcome or the income outcome that they'll be facing during their life. Um, and then I think there's a, ver a lot of uh, great work being done in calibrating very carefully this heterogeneity to uh, the full flow, full flow of funds account and the survey of consumer finance. And this is based on work that they've done before. And uh, I mean, this, this is a considerable uh, contribution being made there. Uh, what do they find? Uh, well, they find that uh, I think this is pretty intuitive. I mean, it's not obvious that all of these results will have carried out automatically, as, as uh, was mentioned in the presentation. But I think, I mean, if you boil it down, uh, we, we see that inflation redistributes wealth away from uh, the asset rich elderly in this, uh, in this setup towards the, uh, the more indebted middle age, uh, middle class homeowners, um, which have typically large mortgages. Doing that, it pushes the price of larger house higher uh, or the more the higher end of, the, of that segment because uh, these uh, middle income people now that have been uh, receiving this windfall uh, are trying to upgrade their house. Again, I think this is pretty intuitive. And finally, uh, inflation reduces aggregate consumption and output ultimately uh, because the middle class households have a lower propensity to consume. They have a longer life, life span ahead of them, allowing them to be more patient. 
Based on that, uh, the author's, uh, I think, interpretation conclusions are that uh, inflation has quantitatively large redistributive effects, uh, and this is an important result in, in, uh, because we've we haven't been exploring uh, the implication in terms of redistribution of monetary policy that extensively. Um, and having a mechanism where you can see that in action, I think, is very important. And uh, the authors uh, suggest that this makes changes in monetary policy contentious from a political point of view. Um, they also conclude that inflation may have a contractionary impact on activity, uh, which is, again, very interesting and maybe counterintuitive. And finally, um, we have some implication for the housing market, which I'll, 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 we've been discussing, and I won't, I won't dwell on that. So what, what do I take away from this in terms of how I think about monetary policy? And I think this has implications for the design of policy frameworks. At the Bank of Canada, in, back in 2011, we went through a process of renewing our inflation target, and we had to think about uh, questions like, should we move to a price level target instead of an inflation target? Or should we think about uh, changing the level of that inflation target? Interestingly, at the time, the, the question was more to lower that inflation target as opposed to increase it. Um, so we went through this, and the distributional questions, like kind of models that are, have been displayed here, were part of the kind of analysis that we've done at the time. And I think this is, this is very relevant. relevant. Um, so I think the, the paper by, by itself uh, speaks to the question of what's the right level of the inflation target. As was mentioned during the presentation, this is a relevant question. It's, uh, it's on the table right now. I don't think personally it should be on the table. I think it's the wrong moment to be thinking about this, but that's, uh, I think we should first achieve our inflation target collectively around the world and then talk about changing them. Um, but it is on the table. I mean, it started with, uh, at the out, at, I think at the, a few years during the crisis with uh, Blanchard and Rogoff, I think, raising that. Uh, the Bank of Canada, in fact, in, has been doing a couple of speeches recently where they have mentioned that this is a question they're studying uh, as part of their renewal for 2016. And there was a lone FOMC member in the last minute that has raised that as well, I believe, uh, from the last minute. So I, I, this is on the table. And I think, um, I think this paper shows another channel potentially why it could be costly to do so. If the intent is really to stimulate the economy, uh, it seems to be working in the opposite direction uh, because it would be contractionary uh, in terms of output if you just look at the output implication. Um, but in that context, I have to say the paper, I mean, the, we were talking about inequality here, uh, and I wasn't sure where the others were coming down in terms of what it means for inequality. Um, so we have uh, in, in their setup, a, um, people are born inequal, unequal by, by, by construction. They, you can either be born rich or as part of the masses, as they put it in the, in the paper. And inflation creates some redistribution in that context towards uh, from the elderly to the middle income people. Um, and so should we think of that? And I don't think this is what, uh, given the German uh, upbringing, I'm not sure that this is what was in the mind here, but uh, I think uh, we, it might suggest, if you just look at the result on the face of it, that it might not be a bad thing for inequality if this is what you're looking after. Uh, inflation might actually be redistributing progressively uh, wealth. Um, it's an arbitrary, potentially, uh, redistribution of wealth, but it, some people could see that as uh, maybe an outcome of that. So, so I think a question is what, what do they make out of this, uh, of this implication for inequality? Uh, and the more general point is, uh, in this case, for, for monetary policy to have something to do in terms of redistribution and inequality, you need to have inequality to start with. So you have to, you have, you have to assume that. And I think that has, that's maybe something for the panel, but I think it begs questions about uh, when we're talking about QE, uh, affecting inequality or unconventional policies, what is really behind the inequality that we're uh, exacerbating potentially. Um, fine, uh, I'll, I'll, I think I have a couple of minutes, so let me make a couple of uh, more points. Um, even if the question is about the inflation target, um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if this is the right experiment to, to look at. Um, and, um, and let me just explain, and again, taking things literally here, um, we have a 500 basis points increase in the inflation target, which means 65% incre in increase in the price level over 10 years. Um, so I think this is huge. Um, people are talking about uh, potentially raising the inflation target, but I think one of the reasons is because the neutral rate might be lower now for reasons that were mentioned in the first session. Um, I think if you look at the survey of economic forecast for the FOMC, it's a few basis points lower now from what they were thinking a few, a few years ago. Dudley made a comment in, back in February that he thought that the, uh, the, f the long run value of the Fed funds rate was three and a half as opposed to four and a quarter. So I think we're talking about like something in the order of 75 basis points. Um, 
And then maybe you say, well, the crisis has shown us that uh, on top of that, the likelihood of hit hitting the zero lower bound is significant, so you want to add some cushion. cushion. Uh, so maybe you're at 100 basis points, 200 basis points, maybe, uh, but I think 500 basis points is, is out of the realm of at least uh, the question, the level of inflation target I would consider seriously. And so then the question is, are, is if that's a question we're after, um, are the results quantitatively important? Uh, and I think there are questions around that because now we're cutting the shock by, uh, it's a two-fifth of the shock now. Uh, I think this is a nonlinear model which would tend to make a bigger shock have even a bigger impact. Uh, so I think we end up with a, a much smaller impact on, con on consumption and, uh, and output. Uh, and also there's another question about the increase being permanent as opposed to being only for 10 years. So. So these are design questions of the framework. The model might allow to do more, uh, but based on the design, I think uh, questions we need to, um, to think about. I'm out of time, so I just want to finish with a couple of things. I think this, um, this experiment is, uh, is useful to think about the 1970s style of situation where you have inflation that goes up by a 500 basis points, and I think this is kind of the order of magnitudes you, you would want to calibrate for the 70s. But then in that case, I think I would see the, the implication as not being really about monetary policy in its implementation, but about uh, the consequences of doing policy mistakes. I don't think any central banks are intending to reproduce the, the 70s outcome, I hope at least. Uh, and in that case, uh, I think this is really about inflation, uh, the cost of inflation, which is important, and it's a design of policy, but less about uh, whether policy itself and its implementation has a distributional impact. I would, I would, uh, this, is, this is getting into a kind of G20 uh, wordsmithing type of things. Uh, if I had to negotiate that text, I would say that uh, changes in inflation target should be politically contentious, it's not really the policy regime. Uh, because, uh, and in fact, I think this is, uh, this is why we think in Canada that uh, the, the agreement on the level of inflation is a political decision and it should be jointly decided by the government and the, uh, the Bank of Canada which is a separate question from the implementation of policy and unconventional policies. Um, so that's where I'm gonna leave it with minus two minutes. And uh, again, I wanna reiterate that uh, this is about the question of this, uh, this forum, but I think this is a very important piece of work. So why don't, why don't you, we'll, we'll, well, I'm gonna keep this short, but come please sit up here for a minute. Um, and uh, uh, Matthias, we'll sit down. And, Matthias, I wonder if you could uh, start by, if you wanted to respond at all to what Jean said. So uh, thanks for your comment. I basically uh, agree with uh, most of what you say. So in, uh, it's, it's of course true, the experiment we do is, uh, is a large uh, change, uh, not exactly what we would uh, expect to be implemented in the next few years. And this is, you know, at this stage, is more exploring what the model does, and so then kind of, a, kind of a drastic experiment makes it a little bit easier. But of course, you can use the same framework to, uh, to assess all kinds of policy options now, and so some of this work uh, still has to be done. This nonlinearity, I think, though, it goes slightly the other way, because the, the, the thing that makes um, things nonlinear is, is borrowing constraints, essentially. You know? So if people are up against borrowing constraints, they, they behave differently uh, compared to being away from it. And because, um, because the experiment we do that uh, is one that relieves borrowing constraints, it moves people away from, from, from the maximum because it, it uh, lowers debt, it would, in fact, be, I think, likely to be nonlinear in the other direction. So it would certainly be smaller, but I, I don't think uh, more than proportionally uh, smaller in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the impact. So that's just in terms of the, uh, the experiment. Um, um, in terms of the aggregate, it's true. The, the output effect on aggregate is relatively small. And, uh, and I think it, it's kind of fair to say that uh, this is probably not the main reason that, um, that uh, monetary policy or inflation changes would affect uh, output. I should also point out, however, that in this paper, we have only looked at one aspect, which is the distribution within the household sector. And another thing that uh, kind of is a bit visible from the very first picture is that uh, one thing that's also going to be important is a distribution between um, the, the broad sectors, namely the, the households, but also the government and, and the foreign mm -hmm. sector. And this is a picture that has completely changed because, as, as, as I mentioned with this picture, uh, by this point, we have a huge amount of assets being held by foreigners and uh, also huge government debt. You know, and so some, uh, some of the potential benefits from uh, inflation would come uh, from deflating some of the government debt at the cost of, uh, of foreigners. And you can think of this very differently depending if you're foreign or, or, or not, but this is, I think, something that would also factor into the, into the picture. So if, if you think, for example, about uh, the debate in, uh, in Europe, it's not so much about uh, you know, kind of rich Germans versus poor Germans, it's uh, to some extent about um, relieving to some extent the pressure of high uh, sovereign debt uh, uh, around the EU zone, and uh, that's something you would also have to figure, factor into account. So, so just to say that, uh, that even though the output effects are small, I think there's a bit more to the aggregate effects than, than we show in this, 
partial analysis. Let me see if there's a question or two, and if not, we'll go right to the panel. Yes, Eric, you want to? Eric, wait for the mic, please. Sorry. Is, is there a bequest motive in the model? How do we think about the fact that, mm -hmm. you know, parents have kids, and if they get worse off, then maybe they could just save a little less and transfer to, to the kids? Right. Mm -hmm. so, so the model has a bequest motive, although the one I've shown you doesn't have that operative yet. That's just... Uh, uh, just uh, you know, a function of how far we have gotten with it. Uh, we had an earlier version so where the bequest motive is there, and, and in fact, we, we do need the bequest motive to make the rich uh, rich enough. Now we do it in a slightly different, more reducible <laughs> way, but um, but but uh, we know that bequests are highly concentrated, uh, you know, just like wealth is, and uh, and so getting bequests is a big reason why the why the rich you know have so much wealth, and so uh, putting that uh, back in there will make the um, declining consumption among the rich smaller. This is, uh, some of this uh, e effect will, uh, will go away. Uh, in, in the past, when we had it in there and used that to reproduce wealth, uh, it wasn't really enough to, uh, to do much of an impact. You know, so, 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 so that's true, it's a concern, but uh, based on what we've done previously, I'm kind of confident it will not be kind of a crucial issue for the overall effect. Uh, uh, the gentleman here. Yeah, I'm a little bit puzzled by, <laughs> by the last paper. No. Uh, in the in my long life in economics, I'm, by the way, I'm Vito Tanzis from the IMF, formerly from the IMF. I've uh, heard the statement by Friedman that uh, the right <coughs> right rate of inflation is minus two. Then, where the Dorn Bush at one point he said 40 percent would be okay. <laughs> then, when we had the seven percent inflation, we worried about indexation of taxes. So, uh, first of all. Does it make sense to say that really the Fed can uh, bring about a 7% inflation and keep it there? Do they have the tool to do that? And second, can they make this an unannounced statement? I mean, people were dreaming. Uh, how can you one day wake up and say we are going to bring 7% and nobody else had anticipated it? It makes no sense to me. So let me say a couple of things about this. So, um, <laughs> what, what, what the, so there's certainly a long debate about whether the target should go up, and I think the ability to maintain a higher target is a big part of that. You know, and uh, and so that's there, and our paper is not about that. It's, it's about a different different uh, part of this debate. Um, I, I would say, however, that uh, certainly in history we have we have observed large changes in uh, inflation that were driven by policy. You know? so so you have seen the 1970s where inflation went up in many countries. By the way, differentially in many countries. So in Germany, much less so than the United States, for example. So there was, I think, some impact. Bragging. Of, uh, monetary choices, <laughs> and uh, there was also the, dis the disinflation in the 1980s, which is kind of the same experiment in reverse. And if you look what uh, disinflation did to U.S. households, um, it's, 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 it's the same thing, just uh, with, with the negative sign. You know? so, so I think if you uh, think of this uh, as, uh, as applicable to analyzing episodes of large change in inflation, I, I think um, we have seen many of those, and so it's, it's very relevant from that perspective. Now, in terms of policy, what's kind of crucial here is, of course, that this is something that has to be you know, to be effective, to be uh, surprising. You know, because if everything is completely anticipated, uh, interest rates would adjust kind of ahead of time and there would be no redistribution. You know, so everything, uh, uh, when you talk of inflation, redistribution is about surprises. And so, uh, so you could do this uh, as a policy, maybe it's a one-time windfall, but this is really not about a systematic policy that you could do on a, on a regular basis. What, what you could do, and this is a more sophisticated policy which we haven't uh, uh, talked about yet, but is uh, to have something that's systematic, but it's, uh, it's linked to the business cycle, where you do some, some kind of you know, pro or counter cyclical variation in, uh, in inflation to, uh, you know, to uh, try to alleviate the burden of debt, for example, in, in a more strategic manner. You know, but uh, there, there's some steps to be taken for sure from the analysis we've done so far to something of that kind. So can, can I just clarify what, what you make out of the paper to make sure I, uh, I understood the conclusion? Are you advocating actually this experiment as something that uh, should be considered? Uh, if so, is it because it reduces inequality? Um, and how do, you, how, do, how do you look at the inequality implication versus the uh, contractionary impact on output? Where do you, uh, where do you land on this? So, um, given that it's a paper on a partial aspect of a policy, I wouldn't you know, take this paper as, as an ultimate uh, recommendation for policy. You know? So it's really more uh, trying to have one tool to assess uh, the, the implication of a policy like this in, in one dimension. I, in terms of my, my personal view, I, I do think that um, the impact on output is there, but it's, it's not particularly large. So, so I, I think whatever the decision is going to be, it's not going to be driven by this, by this output effect. I, I think of uh, the potential desire to, to increase inflation is driven by something else. I, th I think it's driven to some extent, uh, certainly in Europe, you know, by, the, uh, by the desire to lower the burden of, of debt, and partly of governments, but also partly of the, of the private sector, which is not here, but I think this is an important consideration. And um, 
And, uh, and I, th I think that's kind of the, the key aspect, and we want to understand what are the implications of that. In, in, in a place like the United States, you could also think about uh, uh, increasing inflation as a potential tax on, on foreigners who hold uh, what many US assets, you know, which is you know, somewhat uh, mischievous, I guess, but it's certainly something that for aggregate welfare would be, would be relevant. Be careful but what so you I say, someone will take <laughs> you up on that. Yes, Veronica, but I think of this more as, as trying to understand the consequences. Do you want to weigh in on that or anything? I mean, yeah, I would consider that as a side effect of monetary policy rather than direct because of politics. I mean, in inequality. Yes, exactly. Okay, I think we're going to move to the panel, although uh, we don't have enough chairs up here for everybody. So if Don and Kevin and Susan can come up. Jean, you stay here. Yep. You need to. Kevin, Kevin, do you mind bringing the. And then uh, I'm going to ask the authors to feel free to participate from the floor. Uh, 